Hello and welcome to my class from Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack, your instructor, and this is lecture 47. Where we talk about one of the problems with multiple regression that we mentioned very briefly in an earlier lecture, multicollinearity. As we saw, there's a few new things in multiple regression, but the one major new problem that we can face is multicollinearity. This is the problem when one or more predictor variables are highly correlated with other predictor variables. When that happens, all of these predictor variables, the regressors, are not dependent of each other. We sometimes call this confounding. Well, and it can lead to a number of problems which we're about to discuss. Uh, the example I gave in a previous lecture when we introduced multiple regression uh, was this idea of a certain fitness test and they're trying to predict how people will perform on this fitness test and they notice that height is correlated with strength on this test and weight is correlated with strength on this test. Um, but height and weight are correlated with each other. So is uh, do we really have two sets of of predictors or just one um, that is two variables saying the same thing. Let me give you another example that we're going to use quite a bit uh, in, in our next few lectures. It's the body fat data set. Uh, this is a data set you'll find as an Excel spreadsheet on the course website and it, it's based on the idea of trying to be able to predict body fat without having to measure it because measuring body fat accurately is hard. The best way to do that is to measure your body's density. This is done with a full water immersion. They stick you completely underwater. They measure the uh, displacement Archimedes principle uh, and get a measure of your density. Then we have some relationship series equation for example that relates the measured density to percent body fat because uh, muscle and and uh, fat have very different densities. So we could go and measure your percent body fat, but this requires equipment that's not typically available in the home or in the doctor's office. So what we are looking for is a simple way of predicting what this body fat uh, will be using easily obtainable measures like height, your weight, uh, circumference around your chest, your abdomen, eyes, ankles, knees, all kinds of measurements were taken in this experiment. The data set is only for men. Uh, men and women have to be treated separately in this uh, modeling. So the model here is only for men. And the idea is, can we come up with um, a, a small set of measurements that accurately predict body fat? Here's the problem. Many of these measures are highly correlated. So for example, if I measure the abdomen circumference around your gut and I measure around your chest, those two measures are highly correlated. Here we see a correlation that's about 0.92, correlation coefficient. And you have to ask yourself, if I measure one, do I get any extra information by measuring the other? If they were perfectly correlated, then there'd be no new information. One would perfectly predict the other. Here they're highly correlated, so most of the information from one measure may be maybe a little more from the other. Uh, if you have lots of variables, you'll generally try to characterize the pairwise relations using the correlation matrix. Now, this only tells us about pairwise correlations, and there can be more complicated correlations at work. Um, we're going to see how to deal with more complicated correlations uh, a little bit later with some other techniques that we'll learn. But the first thing you want to do is check out all of the pairwise correlations. So uh, many linear regression software packages will automatically generate a correlation matrix for your inspection. Uh, what we look for is high correlation with the response. That's what we want. We want a, a predictor that does a good job of predicting the response. Uh, but we, you'd also like low correlations between the predictor variables. Sometimes, though, we don't achieve that. Let's look at a subset of that body fat data. So the body fat data had something like 10 or 12 measures plus the, the response of percent body fat. 
And here I show a subset of them plotted in, in what I think is one of the most appealing and useful way of visualizing pairwise correlations. Uh, it simply plots uh, two variables. So I have the weight and, and the chest circumference. I can plot weight versus chest circumference here. So you hear the scale of the weight is up here. The scale of the chest circumference is down here. And you see that they're fairly highly correlated. Uh, we have other variables. So bicep circumference and percent body fat, that's not nearly as well correlated. Thigh circumference is not. Abdomen circumference and body fat are more highly correlated. You see a tighter linear relationship. Um, but you also see some variables that are highly correlated with each other. Chest and abdomen, for example. Hip circumference and weight. You see I have a fairly straight linear dependence. Hip circumference and thigh circumference are highly correlated with each other, etc. And then abdomen and biceps are not so well correlated with each other. So we can see a lot of graphically in this plot. We can also turn these plots into numbers, and that's what the correlation matrix does. If we found the correlation uh, with each variable in the response, uh, we'll see that, oh, look, the abdomen, abdomen uh, circumference is the highest correlation. That might be the first variable we want to add to our model. And we'd say, well, the second highest one is the chest circumference. Maybe I want to add that. Well, um, your decision whether or not to add that depends on the uh, correlations between the variables. And you see that chest and abdomen have the highest correlation with each other. So in fact, that might not be the best variable to add. Let's think about the extreme that can happen. If we have perfect multicollinearity, that is the correlation coefficient between variables one and two, let's say, are either plus one or minus one. If that is the case, if I have two variables with perfectly that are perfectly correlated with each other, both in the model, the resulting design matrix will be singular. What that means is I can't invert it. I can't, if I try to invert it, I get divide by zeros. And as a result, we cannot create an OLS estimate. We can't create coefficients for both of these uh, correlated parameters. The only way we can obtain a least square solution is to remove one of those two perfectly correlated variables from the model. Well, perfect correlation is rare, other than some you know, mathematical mistakes that you might make uh, getting two variables that are in fact the same variable included. Uh, we can have models where correlation co coefficients are close to plus or minus one. In that case, we can get some numerical instabilities in our solutions. And uh, we get not divide by zero, but divide by a number close to zero, and we can get some large round off errors and uh, difficulties. But even if we don't get uh, mathematical difficulties from extreme multicollinearity, linearity, we're going to get some interpretive difficulties, which I'll go into in just a moment. On the other side of extreme collinearity, we have orthogonal parameters. Two parameters are orthogonal if their correlation coefficient is zero. Uh, this is a fabulous situation. If you are lucky enough to have a model where both of your predictor variables, say two predictor variables, or all of them even, are orthogonal with each other, then you have the easiest model to use and interpret. Adding or removing one of the variables does not affect the best fit value of the other's coefficients. The standard errors are independent of, of whether you include or, or not include orthogonal parameter. Every parameter can be thought of and treated individually, independent of all the other parameters. Makes for using, interpreting uh, the models extremely easy. This is what we would like. Rarely do we ever get this. Uh, if we get low correlation coefficients between parameters, we're pretty happy. One way to achieve this is to try to design our experiments in order to minimize correlations between predictor variables. We're going to talk about experimental design later in this class. While orthogonal parameters are rare, 
uh, and and perfect correlation is also rare. We we typically are somewhere in between, and we have to worry about whether the correlations are too high. Uh, often we'll use polynomials to fit. Right? We'll have both say x and x squared in our model. Are x and x squared correlated? Well, they obviously are, since they both have something to do with x, right? But how correlated they are depends on the range over which uh, you are, are going. So here's an example with x and x squared. And uh, we see that the correlation coefficient is pretty low, 0.36. This range of x values, but here it's 0.95 over a different range. Um, we can, in fact, derive an exact expression for the variables x and x squared, and uh, those are, are shown here. If, if x starts at a and travels over a range of delta, then here's the exact expression for the correlation between those two variables. Now the correlation between them goes to zero if uh, the starting point is half, minus half the range, minus delta over two. Uh, in other words, I, I, my x squared goes perfectly from one side to the other, uh, zero in between. Uh, I have an offset in these plots, but if I didn't, then x and x squared would be uncorrelated completely. In a common case, uh, we might start at zero, right, or at the minimum of the x squared, and only go positive. When that is the case, we see that, in fact, the correlation coefficient is independent of the range, and it's about 0.97, which is highly correlated. Uh, if A is much, much bigger than delta, right, so I'm only, say, out in this range, uh, you can see that uh, the x squared and the x over some small distance look about the same correlation is even higher. Uh, so depending on the range of x, where it starts and how far it goes, x may be highly correlated or not with x squared. Uh, so even simple polynomials, we have to worry about the idea of multicollinearity. Now as an aside, we standardized the variables, subtracted off their means and divided by the, the standard deviations of the variables. And, and the standardized x and x squared always be uncorrelated. We're going to talk about standardization in the next lecture. We'll come back to that topic. All right, now, what are the impacts of having correlated parameters in our model? Well, if two or more predictor variables are highly correlated, this is typically what happens. You might get good fits in the model. I get small standard error of, of the predicted y's. Uh, we might get good predictions because of that. As long as the correlations remain constant, we can predict what's going on. But the model itself is highly variable. In other words, the values of the coefficients of each of the variables, the beta sub k's, can be biased. We can get non-intuitive values. We expect beta to be positive, and when we fit our model, it turns out to be negative. Further, uh, we get large standard errors for each of the betas, each of the coefficients of our model parameters, and large confidence intervals on those coefficients. If all we want is good predictions, that might be OK. But if we want to interpret the meaning of the parameters, if, in fact, the parameters are what we're trying to get at our model, then uh, multicollinearity multicollinearity can kill our ability to interpret the parameters in the model. For one thing, we tend to interpret each coefficient as a marginal slope. Marginal slope means if I hold all the other predictor variables constant, what's the slope for that predictor variable, the kth predictor variable? Here's the problem. If I have highly correlated variables, then I can't hold all but one variable constant. When the kth variable changes, its highly correlated variable is changing at the same time. So uh, if I can't hold them constant, um, what, how do I 
interpret the meaning of that particular parameter. When we build a model with two or more highly correlated predictive variables, we get some strange things that happen. Uh, while we're building a model, we might add or remove a specific predictive variable. When that happens, it causes large changes in the coefficients of the other predictors, which is correlated with that one that I'm adding or removing. Uh, if we see that happening, we add a parameter, maybe the sign of the predictor variable changes, for example, and that's a very good indication that they're highly correlated. Also, if I have one data set to produce a model, then I have another data set. Uh, I can produce a model and all the coefficients are extremely different than they were before, so that the model coefficients are not transferable from one data set to the next. It's even possible to have a statistically significant model with no statistically significant coefficients. In other words, if you look at the entire model, passes the F test. It, that model is better than no model at all. But if I look at each individual parameter, each one of them fails the S test, the, F, the T test for that parameter individually. In other words, I can have a model where every single model coefficient has a confidence interval that includes zero, and yet the entire model is statistically significant. This is the strange things that can happen with highly correlated parameters. All right, what have we learned in lecture 47? Um, in coming lectures, we'll learn how to deal with multicollinearity when we experience it. Here, uh, let's. what have we learned about multicollinearity? Well, as always, you should be able to quickly and answer and easily answer these questions. What is multicollinearity? What happens to ordinary least squares if two predictor variables have perfect correlation? What is the opposite of perfect correlation between predictor variables? What is a correlation matrix and how is it used? And finally, what happens to models and predictions when multicollinearity exists? Next time, we're going to talk about standardizing our variables, and then we'll talk about how to deal with, detect and deal with multicollinearity in a series of lectures. This is an important problem with multiple regression, and we're going to deal with it in quite a few lectures to come. Till then.